Welcome to the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast. I'm Mike Waters. Today on the podcast, I'm joined by Syracuse basketball great John Wallace. Wallace is one of the greatest players in Syracuse history. Nearly 25 years after his college career ended, he still ranks third in school history in both career points and career rebounds. I talked with John about coming to Syracuse despite an NCAA investigation, some of his most memorable Syracuse moments, and the origins of that famous chant, the Cuse is in the house. Oh my God, oh my God. I'm joined by a guy that a lot of Syracuse fans are going to know right away. He's the number three all-time scorer in school history, number three all-time rebounder in school history. As a senior, he scored more points in a single season than any player in SU history, Mr. John Wallace. John, how are you? Mike, what's up? Now, I think that's my only record that still stands up there. All the rest of them have been, been broken and taken down. So I, I, that's my one bragging point is I scored the most points in the season in, uh, than anyone that ever wore that uniform up there. Do you remember how many points you scored? Or you, can you even guess Four. close? That, well, Mike, you know me. I scored 845 points. The record I beat was 790 by Dave Bean. And Dave Bing held that for a very long time. So, of course, I know how many points I scored. Oh, my God. You got it ex- that's exactly right. You're not even off by a, a little. <laughs> <laughs> what do you expect, man? <laughs> my record. You the only know way I would remember that is if I had it tattooed on my arm, you know? <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, anyway, yeah, you know, an incredible Syracuse career. But, and we'll get to that. But right off the top, I want to talk to you about some of the new stuff you're doing. I mean, right now you're joining me on my new podcast. But as I understand it, you've got a new podcast. Yeah, uh, called Power Forward. It's going to be on Sportscasters. You can go to uh, Sportscasters, John 44, John Wallace 44. Um, doing it with some cute guys. Um, it's going to be really fun, man. I, can't, I really can't wait. I'm excited for it. It's uh, called Power Forward, which is a double entendre. So it's going to be really, really good. Um, Mike, I appreciate you having me. We've had a – how long I've known you now, man? Like 30 years pretty much. I don't think you and I want to admit how long we've known each other because it yeah, would give away our age. That's the truth, man. We've been doing uh, interviews with each other for about 30 years now. So Back to Greece Athena, yep, right? Man. Yeah, exactly. Back to Greece Athena. So um, definitely, you know, I want to show you some love – you know, good luck with your podcast and hope it explodes and takes off. But <laughs> really appreciate you having me on today, man. Well, let's see how it goes technology wise. Uh, and if, if you and I can muddle through this one, then you got to have me on yours sometime. When oh, you absolutely. run out of when you run out of guys like Lawrence Moten and Derek Coleman and those guys, you, when you get down to sports writers, I, I demand a seat. No, Nick, Nick, Nick's going to definitely reach out to you. My, my <laughs> man, Nick's going to definitely reach out. He's already been in contact with you, so he didn't know that you and I had already spoken. So i um, definitely going to have you on the show soon. That'll be interesting. The turnabout. Uh, you'll turn the tables. You can ask questions of the sports writer. Uh, and I got, I got a ton of them, so you better be ready. Oh, crap. <laughs> 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 um, but you're, you're busy with that. You're getting that ramped up. But you're a busy guy anyway these days. I mean, you're working for the Knicks. You work with MSG Network. You've got your 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 hands in other ventures like Heavenly Productions. Oh, yeah, um, Heavenly, Heavenly Productions is is incredible, man. Because we've provided over you know almost about fifteen thousand backpacks filled with school supplies and uh, teddy bears and stuff like that for for kids in impoverished neighborhoods and and uh, and, and in impoverished environments. We've uh, when Hurricane Sandy hit New York, we uh, went out to Staten Island and gave out uh, about 2,500 backpacks. And then we went out, gave out another 2,000. Then we sent some to Rwanda, Dominican Republic. Um, so we've been, we, you know, Heavenly Productions, we've been doing a, a ton of stuff. We just did some in, uh, up at Eagle Academy in, uh, in Harlem. Um, just trying to just trying to get back, man, to help out people as, as, as best we can, especially the people that need the help and want the help and appreciate the help. So that's what I heard that, that Dominican Republic, uh, you know, donation of backpacks that had a basketball connection. That was Felipe Lopez, right? Yeah. So Felipe and I were at a Nick event, um, chopping it up, talking one night, and he was just saying how he was, he had some, you know, he's been doing stuff over in Dominican Republic for a very long time. 
and he had, you know, I think it was like about a thousand kids. And I told him I, I'd give him about however many kids you have, I'll give him that many backpacks plus another couple hundred to give out. Wow. And uh, Kathy, Dr. Kathy Riley Fallon, who's uh, the CEO and started the Heavenly Production with her husband, um, they got everything together and we sent, you know, sent it right over and uh, true to his word, he posted it. He, he showed us the respect and, um, you know, Fleep's one of my boys. We go back to, from uh, high school days. So it was good to help out someone who uh, truly has been helping out a lot of people over in his country. And then your work with the Knicks, the Knicks slash MSG network. Um, it's interesting to me. You were drafted by the Knicks. You played a few years with them. Uh, maybe, what was it, four or five? Two. Is that all? Yeah, it seemed like so longer. How does this relationship continue uh, to this day with the Knicks? Well, you just treat people the way you want to be treated. And uh, I was fortunate to have guys like Dan Gladstone, Artie Bays, Chris Jean, um, Brendan Callahan, guys I worked with in New York who's no longer there, but they brought me on and showed me the ropes and showed me a lot of love. And now I'm working with uh, my guy Brett Tesler and my guy John Ochoa, and uh, they're doing the same thing. And it's been really, really great. And um, I'm, I'm so grateful for the New York Knicks family, the MSG family, for all they've done for me, you know, since I've been drafted. You know, the, a lot of people think I played for the Knicks for three, four, five years. Yeah, including me there for a minute. Yeah, Max Riley, it was only two seasons, but I have such strong New York ties. Everyone knows, you know, I, I love the Knicks. It's my favorite team, always has been. And uh, being able to be on the other side, on the corporate side, working and doing the things on TV. We started a new show called Roast to the Post. That to be coming out soon um, on, on MSG Networks. We got our MSG 150 Sports Talk Show with, my, with Bill Pito, Alan Hahn, Wally Zerbiak, and Monica McNutt. So we're doing a lot of things, man, and I'm 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 very happy to be. Uh, I'm very blessed and fortunate to be a part of a great group of people who just kind of keep me in the loop, and um, things keep kind of falling in my lap, man. That's that's good karma. <laughs> I don't know. I always heard that. Uh perspiration uh led to luck or something like that so <laughs> um, listen you mentioned that the knicks were like one of your favorite teams you know growing up do you want to talk about your other favorite football team the dallas oh, cowboys yeah <laughs> uh right now i'm on a dallas cowboy uh strike i'm not I'm <laughs> really watching the cowboys because it just brings you it just brings you strife and anguish and you know, it just it can ruin your day if you're a true fan. You know, watching us lose the way we've been losing lately, it, to sit through the actual game and watch it is just disheartening. It hurts. How so, did a kid from upstate New York, Rochester, New York, uh, you know, push aside the Buffalo Bills and become a Dallas Cowboy fan? Tony Dorsett. Wow. I'm, 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 that's my favorite player of all time. Watching him, you know, when I was a young kid, man, that's who I wanted to emulate. You know, it was all about Tony Dorsett for me. So that's that's what made me. Plus, my mom's a huge Dallas Cowboy fan. And this year, we were actually planning a trip before the whole pandemic and all that. We, we had a trip planned uh, for her to take her down to, to a Cowboy game at the stadium because she's never been. I've only been there once to the new stadium. But my mom's never been. I was gonna. We were planning a trip this this year, but obviously that's not gonna happen now. Maybe next year. Maybe next year. Well, for the Cowboys in general, I think the the theme right now is maybe next year. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how it goes for your boys. Now, you played a little football growing up, right? Yeah, a lot yeah. of football growing up. Like that was my first love. That's you know from age eight to age 14, 15, that's, that's what I did. And you boxed? Boxed also, absolutely. Um, you you know, that the, 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 the pal, of course I was good. I only had one loss. But the, um, the pal, the, the pal program was so, uh, such an integral part in my sports childhood. It was free. And you had former, you had all policemen working with you. So you, had, you built a rapport with policemen. So when you go, as you grew older and you come across those guys and you're doing something stupid or dumb, they were more likely to let you off for the whatever or just make you run extra at practice. And I, I think that's what's missing in today's world is that 
that whole connection that we used to have, that connectivity back then was, you know, the PAL leagues that were, you know, so many players and so many athletes came through the PAL league for, for in, in Rochester, I, I know for sure, but I'm sure in the PAL leagues across the United States that when they used to be more prevalent, there's all kind of athletes that were being, you know, breeded out of that, out of that PAL and it was free. It taught you discipline. It taught you how to be a team player. It, it taught you how to be accountable. You know, and, and then you, you learn things from the cops and, you know, some, you know, Detective Stevens, uh, Sergeant Connors, all those guys would ride around with us and just talk to us about life. And, you know, and, and we worked hard as we could because we know if we work uh, as hard as hard as we were supposed to, we got Carvel ice cream with the sprinkles on it. And that was that, you know, what's better than that? <laughs> Not much when you're a kid. That the Carvel, <laughs> all you need to know. Um, we've talked before uh, and often uh, about you coming from Rochester to Syracuse, and right about the time that you know you had already made your decision or you were making it, Syracuse was being investigated uh, by the NCAA, and they would eventually go on probation for your freshman year. And a lot of folks, including myself, look back on that time. And, you know, we've put the tag on you as maybe uh, the most critical recruit in Syracuse basketball history, that if you hadn't come, who knows what the program's fate would have been there over the next few years. Um, why? And I know other schools were after you uh, when that NCAA stuff started. I know Kansas was there. I know Providence was sniffing around. Why did you decide to come to Syracuse knowing that your freshman year you weren't going to be in the NCAA tournament? Cause I, I love Syracuse, man. I've always loved Syracuse style, the way Coach Beheim coaches, uh, and the players at Syracuse are more like my kind of my ilk. Um, so I, you know, I went to I visit. I took a visit to Kansas, Providence, Pittsburgh, which sucked, um, and, and UConn, which I ran into Jim Calhoun for three or four years ago at my son's game when when my son uh, Joey played against UConn. And he basically was saying, like, I was the recruit that got away because if I'd have went there, we'd have definitely got a national championship if it was me, Danielle, Ray Allen. But, you know, I cut him off mid when he was getting ready to name all the names. I said, man, I'm a cute guy. I couldn't imagine playing with those guys. <laughs> I bleed orange, man. I couldn't imagine playing with those guys ever. So, um, yeah, I definitely I definitely could have went somewhere else. But, I, you know, I've always loved Syracuse. I, and, uh, you know, that's another thing I could bring up to the guys when we all get together like we do every year. I got the most points in the season. And Coach Beheim out of his own mouth, said I'm the most important recruit in Syracuse history. So, I mean, it's really hard to usurp those two things. Because <laughs> they can't go back and add more points to their career. They can't be more important than I am right now to yep. Syracuse because Beheim already said it. So, you know, that, those are the two things I kind of hold over the guys when we get together. Win a, win a few arguments with Derek Coleman and Billy Owens and those guys. Absolutely. That's the only way you can win it because, I mean, Derek's got the argument for, you know, first pick overall. Billy, you know, arguably the greatest three years in Q's history. I mean, he just put up incredible numbers. Um, so and, and they both, you know, went high in the draft. So that's only – I got I to gotta resort to those, those kind of tactics to get some victories. <laughs> You know, I got to ask you about a couple of games, a couple plays uh, in your career. We're going to go to your senior year. In the Sweet 16, 1996, you guys are playing Georgia. Mm -hmm. And you guys are down by two with 2.1 seconds to go. And there's a timeout. You guys have the ball around midcourt. So there's not a lot of time. Um, and Jim Beheim devises a play that doesn't give the ball to his star player. The, he doesn't give the ball to the guy who scored 22 points a game that year. He has you as the inbound guy. How did that go over in the huddle with you? Well, of course I wanted to take the shot, but he convinced me to take the ball out because I was our, our, our best passer, our best inbounder, and I inbounded the ball like all year. So he trusted me to inbound the ball because if you don't inbound the ball properly, there's no shot anyways. So, you know, and it worked out. Um, obviously I was like, I wanted to get the shot, but I understood that it's bigger than me, right? You got to be willing to trust the coach in, in that situation. And, I, you know, we did, 
and it, it worked out in our favor. And I, I just remember being so happy when Jay Sapola hit that shot. And I remember thinking, we're, we're definitely going to win in overtime now. It's our game. Uh, I was just so ec- ecstatic that he hit that shot. And, uh, and I knew we were going to sh- win the game after that. Well, earlier this year when the NBA was having its playoffs, the Toronto Raptors played the Boston Celtics. And there was an inbound play similar for the Raptors when they threw it. You, they weren't out at half court. They were in their part of the front court. But it was a cross-court pass. Man, I had flashbacks. I was like, that is John Wallace to Jason Cipolla almost all over again. Very similar, uh, except OG o- o- no- Anobi hit a uh, three and Cipolla hit the uh, like 15, 17 foot baseline shot, but very similar pass. Shannon Anderson, uh, re- you know, just over his hand. And I think that was uh, uh, for the Celtics, the, the athletic guy, I can't remember. Jalen Brown, I think that was Jalen Brown guarding him. He just missed that pass and missed blocking it also. So very similar, but, um, you know, Man, it, 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 when you're watching the games, and I don't know about you, but the, to me, the NBA uh, playoffs this year is like the best basketball we've seen in a very long time. It was very high level. It was uh, great. Really, really good, exciting basketball every single night. And you I know, love the NCAA tournament style of it. It was like three, four games a day. It was, it was oh, awesome. I, I totally agree. And I'm, I'm, I'm a college guy. I'll admit it. I, I like the college game. Grew up in college towns. But, man, the NBA playoffs were fun this year. Now – Going back to that Georgia game, though, you mentioned that Jason shot, tied it, sent it to overtime. In overtime, you hit a three when you guys were down one and there was time was running out. Um, actually, Georgia made a shot to put them ahead by one. And the ball came into you. And I remember talking to a, team, a teammate of yours, your buddy, Lazarus Sims. As you're dribbling down court, he's yelling to you to get him the ball because he's the point guard. And the quote from Lazarus is, he ignored the hell out of me. <laughs> Man, you think I was giving that ball up in that situation? Absolutely oh. not. <laughs> Plus, I was. I went. I, I. I. I took a quick glance at the clock, and I wanted to get down and get a shot up. So if I did miss, we had a chance to get an offensive rebound put back. That's why I took the uh, three at the top. Well, it was a two because so my foot was on the line, but they gave me three. Oh, you admitted like, that now. Well, I know it was on the line. Okay. All right. I wasn't going for a three per se. I was going for a shot at the top of the key, my favorite sweet spot. You know, I knew I was going to, you know, that, that gives me a good sh- chance of making that shot. And if we, if I happen to miss, I was following in and trying to get the offense rebound or whatever. But when it went in, you know, it changed everything. And, and luckily – we, some of us thought the game was over because I hit the shot. My, you know, I was like, game over. But Jay Sapola had the wherewithal to uh, keep playing and, and tip the ball, I think, from the point guard. I think his name is Pertha, maybe, or something. But he tipped the ball Robinson, from behind right? off his time as Pertha Robinson, so he couldn't get the shot off that he ended up missing anyways. But he, Sapola had the wherewithal to mess up his timing. Who would have thunk Jason Sapola played a little defense? <laughs> <laughs> that's terrible I'm never getting Jason Zapola on the podcast with that line if he finds out anyway uh, <laughs> you know that was also the year that you guys introduced Syracuse fans to a song by Blase Blase well that started in Arizona uh, after we beat Arizona I, I, I was interviewed by Brubaker and at the end of the interview I just you know, I've been switching the words up from that song for a while already, just saying when the Cuse is in the house. And I, I said on the video, you know, because everyone, no one gave us a shout out in Arizona because they were highly ranked. They had a 54, 55 game, non-conference home game winning streak. And we shut all that down. And I mean, we just went out there and we we, we literally, they, they didn't have a chance. And we beat them my junior year in Syracuse. And then we went out my senior and we beat them in Arizona. So we owned Arizona, man. I mean, we had those guys in our back pocket. They didn't want it. You could see it in their face. They were scared to death. So you, around that time is when Cuse is in the house. Oh my God. Oh my That's God. When it started. I, I started it that after that game. That's when it started. <laughs> and it, you know, it, it took off as we started winning in the tournament and we started chanting after the games and it just caught on like wildfire, man. Especially when we had the, the late great Al McGuire dancing to it, you know, it, 
that, that set off, that, you know, that just set it off. How special of a memory is that? I mean, I, I, know, I knew Al a little bit and knew what a character he was. Uh, but for you guys, you guys were so young. I mean, Al McGuire was a different guy to you guys, right? Well, he was yeah. Well, he, he, I knew well, him as a coach. Well, he, yeah, he's a coach and broadcast legend. So, <laughs> you know, he was like, he, he felt so good. And to have him dancing from our song was, you know, it was dope. It was, we all had that on our video somewhere still. Um, so, uh, but that whole moment was special for Syracuse. It was special for our team. No one expected us to do that much that year. Um, we weren't even picked in the top 25 in the preseason polls. Mm -hmm. We had to win 11 or 12 straight to start the season to get, you know, to be become highly ranked and to get some recognition and respect. So, um, it was just a great season for us. We just couldn't end it the way I would love to have ended it, you know, with a championship, but we made it to the championship game. And against one of the arguably the you know one of the greatest college basketball teams ever, yeah. And, and as good as they were on that night, we if I didn't foul out, we definitely would have won. I just I just wish Lazarus would have threw the alley oop instead of the chest pass that got deflected, because if it was right. a four point game at that point, he throws that alley oop. What? You were down three. You sure? I'm pretty sure, and now right. I'm not so sure. <laughs> No, you might be right. I, I didn't know if it was three or four, but I know. Hey, you remembered you had 845 points right <laughs> off the top of the podcast. I just know if he'd have threw that alley-oop, I definitely would have dunked it. And it would have been either a two or one point game. Yep. They're reeling. I'm looking in their face. Their best player, Tony Duck, only had four points in the second half. They didn't know what to do. They Because they didn't have no really go-to, go-to guy if Tony wasn't hitting. And he, did, he wasn't hitting in the second half. You know, and uh, Ron Mercer had the game of his life, you know, coming off the bench as a freshman. And, uh, you know, the rest of those guys just had, like, you know, kind of average games or whatever, but, you know, just so many of them. You know, you told me a, a while ago, several years ago, that that's the one game you've never gone back and watched. No, I still haven't watched it. I'll okay. never watch that game. That game's too painful, man. You know, because I – truly in my heart, I know – we would have won if I didn't foul out, so that hurts. And, you know, I went up to all the refs after I fouled out, and I told all three of them they, they jerked me, man, because a couple of those fouls are definitely bogus. They, they, they called the jump ball, and then the one guy overturned it and gave me a foul. It was definitely a jump ball, if anything. Um, so, you know, just a couple – even at my last foul, when I was going after the loose ball from Mark Pope, that wasn't like a foul. I mean, look at it, man. Uh, so. You know, it was just a couple of questionable calls, especially in the championship game in my senior year, I, I thought they gave me a raw deal. You know, I know we I mentioned him earlier, but Lazar Sims, you and he had such a special relationship. And one of the best stories I think you've ever told me about you and Z was how you guys would go at it after practices in one on ones. Yeah, but I mean it wasn't Mike. Let's let's put things in perspective. Z's my boy. Right. He he took a lot of L's. I mean, <laughs> he took a lot of L's, man. I mean, you know, I was I was a handful for him. I'm, you know, so but we did, we definitely got it in. All of us did. My mm -hmm. myself, Lawrence. Um, you know, we, we played a lot of one on one, a lot, you know, before and after practice or just uh, you know, during pickup. Because it's always about bragging rights. Who's going to be able to brag that day about who, you know, who got, you know, who won the games and who's going to be talking junk the rest of the night? You know how that goes, Mike. And that that junk talking lasts till the next game <laughs> and during the next game. <laughs> and you know me, I'm supreme talk, the talker of the team. I'm the oracle. So, you know, I was always talking. So that means I was always winning. I won a lot of those games. Lawrence and I had a lot of, you know, Lawrence – he was, he was so good, a one-on-one -on -one man, just that, you know, his, his nickname is, is so apropos because you're he, trying to figure out how he's getting his shot off and how I couldn't block it sometimes when he just seemed to be moving so slow and effortless. It was, you know, it's it like a, it was like a mind, you know, it, it, it mess up, it would mess with your mind a little bit, man. It's like the matrix, seriously. 
you know, one of my other early podcast guests is Jay Billis. And we learned in that one that when he was just out of college, he appeared in a movie. And you've never heard of it. Trust me, but it's called I Come in Peace. But you've appeared in a movie. And I think a lot of people actually have heard of it. He got game. I'm still getting checks for that movie, Mike. They're not huge, but I get them every month, man. And uh, as Spike Lee said, give me everything you got on every episode, on, on every scene. And this movie will pay you the rest of your life. And true to his word, it, it has. And a lot of the NBA guys, all the young guys, they come up watching that movie. Like when I, when I run into like the Dame Lillards and those guys, they always like, you know, I'm just watching. He got game the other day. And, you know, the, I got hops. You know, that all came from that all came from that, you know, he got game. So a lot of the young NBA guys, they all came up watching that movie and it's you know, it's special. Did you meet Denzel Washington on that movie set? Yeah, we were all on set, man. And uh, you know, Denzel is as cool as they come. And uh and Ray Allen did his thing, you know, acting. He really bought in and, you know, dove into the acting role and you know, with the acting coach and everything. Um we were we were all in, man, and the uh, the basketball scenes in that movie were were incredible because it was just us really straight hooping. There was no right, scripted. Okay. It was just us playing pickup ball over the course of a month, two months, three months that Spike took uh, the, the the scenes from. The basketball scenes were a lot better, and he got game than they were in Teen Wolf. We'll 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 agree. <laughs> <with that. laughs> Absolutely, and you know there was another Syracuse guy in that movie. Jim Brown, right? Jim Brown was yeah. in that game, wasn't it? Yeah, the detective. Absolutely. It's always Syrac Syracuse everywhere. So, you know, anything dealing with uh, film and the film industry has probably got someone, if it's not an athlete or an entertainer type, it's a new house type. So we're, <laughs> we're definitely represented at all levels. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. All right. So the 1996 draft, um, another guy in that draft was Kobe Bryant. And sadly, we lost Kobe earlier this year, tragically. Um, but you've told the story about how Kobe uh, ruffled more than a few feathers with some of the older guys, right? At the after the draft, it was at, at the uh, the rookie orientation, wasn't it? Hey, man, he was talking so much junk, and uh, you know, Kobe was saying and, and telling us the things he was going to do, or whoever was in the earshot, what he was going to do. And, you know, a couple of times I literally just told him, like, just be quiet, man. Like, no one wants to hear it, you, you know, because we really didn't know him. We didn't. Like, the college guys didn't really know him. The NBA guys, and especially the Sixers, knew him because he was working out with them, playing with them. So they knew how good he was. But to us, we didn't, we didn't. We had no idea. So we're just like, get out, you know, be quiet with all that noise. But when I ran into him um, some years later, I had to apologize to him, man, because everything he said came to fruition. He said he's going to win titles and scoring titles and rings and, you know, be the best player in the game. And there definitely was a stretch during his career where he was the absolute best player in the game. And uh, that's just a, a credit to his tireless work, work, work ethic that he displayed at all times and his uh, endless pursuit of, of, per, of perfection on the basketball court and, and also always kind of chasing that Michael Jordan thing, man. And I, I you know, I, I think of all the players who who's been compared or, you know, thrown into that Michael Jordan uh, typecast or Jordan-esque, um, Kobe came the closest. Yeah. The, um, and 96 draft is the greatest draft ever, Mike. Don't forget that. Well, you had Allen Iverson, right? Ray yeah. Allen, you. Uh, Kobe, Steve, Steve Nash, Stojakovic, Peja, sure, Amby, out of you, Stephon Marbury, Antoine Walker. We got a lot of rings. We got a lot of we got MVPs. We got a Hall of Famers. We got everything. And the '84 draft is good, but we're better. And in, in 2003 draft, you know they can 2003 and. 84 can argue over who's second, but we, we're definitely first. Ooh, 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 okay. <laughs> you, you, you beg to differ? 2003 draft might be a little, maybe not as deep, but they, at the top. I mean, we just, LeBron, Melo, and D-Wade. Yeah, but guess what? Guess what? 2003 okay. has Darko Millich, Darko. 
Eh, I don't know. I, you know, blame the Pistons. That was the second pick in the draft. That immediately brings your whole value down. You know that in the company and the business. If you have a writer that's writing with you and he sucks <laughs> and he's putting out more, more, uh, more, more articles than you, your paper's going to fail. <laughs> so the whole time that Darko was in the league, he brought their whole 2003 draft class down, man. You know that. Oh, wow. okay. All right. <laughs> We don't have a Darko Miller chick up top like that. <laughs> I mean, Darko's av career averages in the NBA were just – you can't even really print them. Where were they? Can you imagine if the Pistons had taken Carmelo or D. Wade instead? Oh, my. Yeah, yeah that, that, that might not have been fair. But I would have loved that they took Melo because Melo would have had a ring. Yeah. You know, he would have had a ring with that team. I, and I, I just and, – and I think because of the way they were set up, Melo would have had the buy into coming off the bench that year. As a score, and I, you know, so he, but he would have had a ring because you know th that team was th that team was so good, man. That yeah, team was good. Oh, fine. Hey, last thing before we wrap it up. Um, this past winter, uh, late February, uh, you had your jersey retired. Uh, the number forty-four, for the second time in Syracuse history, went up to the rafters. Uh, of course, Derek Coleman's forty-four was up there first. Um, yep. Yep. 44. What did that mean to you? Uh, man, honestly, Mike, it meant everything from a basketball. It's the greatest achievement in my basketball life. Um, you know, such a storied, uh, prestigious university with all those great players that are already hanging up there in the rafters to join that, the pantheon of greats. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's inexplicable, man. So, um, but that's, that, that's, that's all the hard work. And you start thinking about all those days when, you know, you had the option of either going to hang out with your friends or going to the basketball court. And I always ultimately chose to go to the court. Um, I, I, I tried to never short, short change myself. And because of it, man, I mean, that's the ultimate reward is to have your Jersey forever hanging in the rafters um, at, at, at the dome or the new dome that's coming up. Um, so, yeah, man, it meant, it meant everything, Mike. It, you know, from, from a basketball standpoint, it meant everything. All those years of sacrifice and um, hard work, blood, sweat, and tears, giving everything you had. Some people are saying I should have possibly went somewhere else. How could you go to Syracuse because they're on probation? Well, it all made sense. It always made sense to me. Don't ever, don't ever forget that. But it all made sense to everyone else that night you know, to see my number going up in the rafters. It made, it made all the sense to everyone. And you know, sometimes uh, there's a saying that one day it all makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. And that was a day for everyone else who didn't understand my perspective and how I felt about Syracuse that night, that day on February 29th, the leap year, Coach Behind 44th season. So, it was, uh, you know, it all made sense that night. Well, you gave Syracuse fans a lot of great nights, a lot of great memories. And so I'm glad that you got that one uh, at the Dome last February. So uh, and I want to thank you again for joining me here on the on the podcast. It's been a pleasure. It's always great to catch up with you, John. All right, Mike. Thanks a lot, my brother. I appreciate it. I'll see you soon.